Okay, take your Bibles this morning. We're going to look at Second Peter chapter number three. Now, you that come here every Sunday, you know uh, this is a little bit out of normally what I normally do and how I arrange a message. I was studying and praying the other day, and this thought uh, came on my mind. And in, in just a few seconds, I wrote these thoughts down and then filled them in later and then studied it last night. And I'm going to give it to you by the help of the Lord. This is something that you'll never hear on TV preaching, so listen while you get a chance. You might have one in a hundred, but it'll be rare. This is the kind that don't go over too good on TV. It's the Bible. It's God's Word. And I want to take Second Peter 3, and I'm going to go slower this morning than normal, so I want you to keep your Bibles open and follow along with me. It might be just a little bit hard for you to stay with me the first few minutes, and then I'm going to have a short message. So I want to preach this morning on the subject, what will you do when the world's on fire? What will you do when the world is on fire? Look in 2 Peter chapter number 3, and I want to begin reading with verse number 2. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Hold your finger there. I'm going to read a little bit and stop. Read a little bit and stop. The Bible said right in the last days that there would be a lot of scoffers. What's a scoffer? Somebody that ridicules, makes fun of, laughs at the Word of God. And it said they would just be laughing at it. And it said walking after their own lust. Do you know what makes people... On, on the news and all them ridicule the Word of God and life about because they're serving their own lust. And serving your own lust will make you a mocker of the Word of God and the things of God. It said they'd just come mocking like, like they do on the Huffington Post, MTV, VH1, HBO, all of them, I, I, I don't... Um, we don't have HBO or nothing like that. But I saw on YouTube one of the blasphemers, the main blasphemer on HBO, uh, give an interview the other day talking about how stupid people are and how crazy. He said that, he said that the story of Jesus coming by the, bir the virgin birth of Mary and all that was the silliest, stupidest story he's ever heard in his life. Bill Maher said that. There shall come in the last days scoffers. That's a scoffer. Anybody who says the story of Jesus Christ being born on this earth is a stupid is a scoffer. Amen? And is an ignorant person themselves. Now look here. Here's what they said they'd be saying. Verse 4. And saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, hold your finger there again. You know what the scoffers will be saying? Where is the promise of His coming? It means this. He said, you'll know you're in the last days because people are going to sit around and say, I've heard that all of my life. Since the fathers fell asleep, people have been saying that. How many of you ever heard anybody say that? Raise your hand. Boy, the next time they say that, jump up and down, clap your hands and say, Whoa! That means He's coming sooner because you just fulfilled the Scripture. He said right before he comes back that people will be saying, where is he? I've heard that grandma and grandpa used to say he was coming back. He ain't never come back yet. That's what he said they'd say in the last days. Verse 5. Now look at verse 5. College professors, teachers of evolution, scientists. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with science if it's not false science. False science is anything that's against the Bible. As long as science lines up with the Word of God, it's great, right? We're not against science. We're against craziness and lies. Look here what it said in verse number 5. For this 
They are, are willingly are ignorant. A person is willingly ignorant. That's what Hoven said that means. Dumb on purpose. That means as they're willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, verse 6. Wherefore, the world that then was, the old world being overflowed with water, perished. Now look at verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire. Somebody say it. What does it say unto? Fire. Against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This Bible says God's going to destroy the world again, but it won't be water next time. It'll be fire. It won't be water next time. It'll be fire. God will never destroy the earth again with water. He promised he would. Next time, it's fire. It's fire. He said, unto fire against the day of judgment. Now, let's look at verse 8. See where we're at. See where we're at on God's counter. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The two greatest words for understanding the Bible are like and as. You don't understand the Bible by getting a Bible education. You understand the Bible by getting to know the author and on your knees seeking him and reading it. That's how you, get, you understand the Bible. There's nothing wrong with a Bible education. Nothing wrong with a, with, nothing wrong with a, uh, a college degree. But that ain't how you understand the book. You understand God's Word by believing it first and seeking him and get, letting him teach you what that book said. So the greatest two words in the Bible to learn it is like and as. If you're a teacher, you want me to tell you the best way in the world to teach? Same way the Lord said, like and as. Somebody says, well, I don't understand that. Okay, you understand this? Yeah, I understand that. Okay, that's like that. That's what Jesus said. The kingdom of God is like unto, as as. The greatest way of teaching, you ain't going to improve on that method of teaching of what Jesus said by similitude and by, uh, by illustration and by repetition, those three ways, similitude, uh, illustration, and repetition. An illustration is what, it's like cutting a hole in there and putting a window in the wall. It lets light in. Did you hear me say like? It's like cutting a hole in that wall, and it lets light in. That's what an illustration is. Let's light in. So the Lord says this. He said, one day is with the Lord a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. Have you ever wondered why God took six days to make the earth and rested the seventh day? Wonder why he did that. He didn't. You think about stuff like that when you're reading? I mean, uh, why did he do that? He said one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Did you ever say he made this and that first day, this and that second day? This and that third day. This and that fourth day. This and that fifth day. Plants, animals, uh, stars, planets. He made the sun on the fourth day. He made man on the sixth day. Now, you know why God did that? Why didn't God just make it stay daylight all the time? Why did he even make a night? Why didn't he just make it where we stayed awake all the time? All that's a picture. All that is teaching us something. The creation testifies of God and His realness and teaches us. So if one day is as a thousand years, each one of them days represents a thousand years of history. You know where we are right now? We at the end of the sixth day, about ready to begin, the seventh. Six thousand years of human history. There is no, listen to me, there is no recorded history of man being on this earth past 6,000 years ago. There is none. You say, well, what about them skeletons and them bones and them fossils and all that? There is no written evidence of history of man being here past 4,000 B.C. Never has been, never will be. You know why? Because he wasn't here past 4,000 B.C. going back there. God made it. He made him here. And he said he'd give him two days. Then they had the flood. Two more days had Jesus come and dies on the cross. 2,000 years. 2,000 years, flood, Abraham, approximately four or 500 years difference there. Then two more days, 
the fourth day, the sun shows up. You know why God made the sun, S-U-N, on the fourth day? You know what a man said one time? He said, well, all them days represent millions and millions of years. Not really. There were plants and life on the earth for millions of years without no sun. I don't think so. Uh, they have plants one day and sun the next. And uh, they, he made the sun there. You, you're better off just to take that book just like it says. You'll never go wrong taking your Bible at face value and never be intimidated by anyone or anything who supposedly found something to contradict it. So if, if the sun shows up on the fourth day, the S-O-N, Son of God, shows up 4,000 years in history right on the schedule. You get 4,000 before him, 2,000 after him, and then that last one is the day of rest. The seventh, that's the millennial reign. The 1,000 years millennial reign. Now listen, people. Why do you think God rested on the seventh day? I was preaching one time somewhere in a big old crowd, and they was into it, you know. They was awake, and uh, they, they was into it. And, and boy, there's a man and me and on it. I said, why do you think God rested on the seventh day? And some old boy about halfway back called out and said, because he's tarred. I said, no, God wasn't tired. Uh, God, God don't get tired, amen? God don't get... You think the Lord come in, he, he worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, six days and said, whoo, all this creating has wore me out. I'm going to take tomorrow off and go fishing. No, God don't get tired. He, he could have just made everything in a split second, right? He could have just said, bam, and there was everything, man, fish, animal, that. But he didn't. He done it to teach us. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night uttereth knowledge. Let the universe, let the stars, the planet, let it teach you like it did Job. And he said, 6,000 years of human history, then the day of rest. Now listen, that day of rest is the millennium. You know what's getting ready to happen? I can tell you. I hope all the politicians know this. Most of them don't. I wish we could tell them. You know what's getting ready to happen? This world, no matter who runs it, no matter who's in the government, this world is headed for a one-world government, a one-world monetary system, a one-world religion, and as so sooner or later, it's all coming down to where when the Lord comes, they're going to step a man out on the scene. He's called the Antichrist. He is totally against God completely. He's, he's the devil in the flesh. Just like Jesus was God in the flesh, the Antichrist is a devil in the flesh, and everybody's going to have to have a mark, that chip or something, in your right hand. They're already testing it, or in your forehead, and you can't buy or sell without that mark. One world monetary system. And brother, the iniquity of man gets worse and worse, and they curse God, and they hate the Bible. And then one day the Lord's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom and rule on this earth Hold your finger there now. I ain't through reading my scripture yet. Then I'm going to preach. It ain't going to hurt you to miss dinner today. We'll just have Sunday morning, Sunday night service together today. Amen. Amen. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something this morning. Listen, when the Antichrist comes and sets up his throne, his kingdom, he's going to sit as God in the temple of God, claiming that he's God, and all the world wonders after the beast. Then Jesus comes back with his saints, sets up his kingdom for 1,000 years. That's the millennium. Break that word in two. Mill, thousand, annum, annual. 1,000 years. That's a picture of the Sabbath of rest in the Old Testament. So we, me and you, in our glorified bodies, rule and reign with the Lord for 1,000 years. That's before the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God. If you died right now, your body would go in the grave, your soul would go to home and be with the Lord. When he comes back with you, get your brand new body, and we're going to come back in the millennium, and we're going to rule with him for a thousand years. Now, the devil will be put on the chain gang during this thousand years. He'll be shut up, and a great angel going to take a chain, wrap it around him, bind him for 1,000 years. You know what's going to happen? All that time, there's going to be people on this earth. Everybody don't die during the tribulation. There will be people who live through the, the tribulation, go right on into the millennium, during the millennial reign, still have a sinful nature, still reproduce, children to be born, and everything. 
So there will be people still with a sinful nature. While the devil's in prison, he's like Charles Manson. He's saying, when I get out of here, I'm going to get my gang, gang together and, and we're going to take over this thing and, I, and we're going to throw God off his throne. All of that thousand years, and people are still here. At the end of the millennium, the Lord said, all right, we're going to do this. Uh, that's, uh, we're going to let Satan out for a little while. And when he gets out on, on, on the bail there for a little while, he gathers all the armies together for one last chance to throw God off the throne. And that time, the Bible says, fire comes down out of heaven and devours him. And the devil is, is took again and thrown that time into the lake of fire and he ain't never going to get out. He's going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever because he deceived the whole world to which all God's people ought to say, Amen. Thank God the devil's going to be thrown into hell. You ought to be glad about that. He hates you. He hates your family. He hates your kids. He's the cause of all the trouble in this world is the devil. He'll be bound. Now, I'm going to finish reading my scripture here in just a minute. Uh, but here, here's what the Bible said. The Bible said that's going to happen. You see, when Jesus died on the earth, on, the, on, the, on this earth, on the, on the cross, on this earth, he paid for everything. Now, you don't get all the benefits of the atonement the minute it happens, which means this. When you got saved, you get born again. You're born again, but you don't get your new body. You don't get your new body till the Lord comes back. When he comes back, then this old body will turn into your new body. He's not going to just make you a brand new one that's there. He's going to take this old one and make your new one out of your old one. Where does that come from? Philippians, among other places. Who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be what? Changed. He's, uh, so when you're saved, you're bought and paid for, but you don't get your new body yet. I was telling a boy the other day, he couldn't figure out why he couldn't get healed. He couldn't get healed. He said he prayed and prayed, and he couldn't heal. I said, listen, brother, God does heal, can heal, will heal. He still does. But you don't get all the benefits of the atonement the minute you get saved. Some of those benefits, some, you're not ever going to be totally, completely, permanently healed until you get that new body, brother. And then you ain't never going to have to worry about it again. Now, when that happens, you'll get that new body, and you'll get that. Now, the world's the same way. So when Jesus died, he bought the whole creation. Creation. So we bought and paid for the world, the planet, the earth that we're walking around on. But the earth is born again right here at the millennium. The earth is born again. The curse is lifted. The wolf and the lamb, remember that, shall lay down together. And, the, and the, we're going to have peace for 1,000 years. A child will be 100 years old. They'll go back to living like they did in the Old Testament, seven and eight, nine hundred during that millennial time. So the curse is lifted, but the earth don't get its new body until it's burned up. And in Revelation 20 and 21, after the earth is burned up, he said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. He's going to make the new earth out of the old earth. Where do you get that? The Bible said, as a vesture thou shalt fold them up. He's going to take the old earth, burn it up, the heavens are on fire, and make the new earth out of the old earth, just like he makes your new body out of the old body. Now, I'm, yeah, that's a lot of doctrine here I've given you this morning, but I want to have a long introduction and a short message, real short. Look at the next, next verse. Now look at verse number 7. Now, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are reserved, uh, it's kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment, the great white throne, and perdition of ungodly men. Now, look at verse number, uh, let's see, verse number 10. Well, verse 9 says you ought to repent. The Lord's giving you a chance to repent right now. We'll skip that for time's sake. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come. Now, the day of the Lord never refers to one 24-hour day. The day of the Lord is a whole period of time here. Like we'll say back in that day and that day, we're not talking about just one day. We'll get into that when we study the future events and eschatology and the future events, stuff that's coming on this earth. The day of the Lord, verse 10, will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent 
feet. And the earth, look at verse 9, y'all. That ought to scare everybody in the world. The earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God's going to burn the whole world up. He said he was in the Bible. Seeing that all these things must shall be dissolved, what kind of person? Man, you ought to be in all holy conversation and godliness. Look at verse 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. What's going to happen after that? Verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. What are you going to do when the world's on fire? I know what I'm going to be doing. What are you going to do? Now we've all seen this week, we've all seen this week uh, the terrible fires. Fires over here in the cove, fires up in the mountains, fires over there in, in, uh, in toward Tennessee, fires are everywhere. Uh, they had to evacuate uh, Chimney Rock, the whole town, this this couple of days ago because of fire. Fires are breaking out everywhere. People are scared. People are in danger of their house catching on fire. And, and you know, they showed them fire. They had worst fires ever in California this summer. They said they'd never seen it like that. Big old 1.5, 1.8 million dollar houses. I mean, just going up like that. And you know what? It's a terrible thing. There's three things that when they get out of hand, you better get out of the way. One of them's wind, one of them's water, and the other one's fire. When God wants to completely clean something up, you know how to completely clean something up? Burn it up, brother. Burn it. Uh, in my uh, uh, mom's house, uh, the old carpet had been down there for, for uh, over 20 years. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Chris and Jeremy are staying over there right now. And, and we're and we there, and man, that carpet, you'd walk in that room and it would curl your nose. And I said, I'm going to fix this carpet. And so I, I went to the dollar store, and I, I, I rented one of them things, and uh, I got me a, a, a bottle of that stuff, and I went in there, and I put about twice as much of that uh, soap cleaner that you're supposed to, and I started running that machine over that car. It couldn't, I couldn't tell a bit of difference. That big black spots were still there. I, and I said, uh, I, said, I tried to convince myself, well, I got it. Well, I got it. And, then, and I said, maybe it still smells because it's wet. And uh, then I let it dry out, left the windows open. Next day, come over there. It was, it, it was, your nose would do like that when you walked in. I mean, it's awful. Wang. I went and they, they said, go get kitty litter, Brother Danny. I went, I ain't never bought kitty litter in my life. I, th I think, uh, I think kitties and litter both ought to be out in the cold. I'm, I, I, if, if you're a cat lover, I, my, I'm preaching right now, so you sit there and hush. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you something, brother. I, I bought kitty litter for the first time in my life. And they said, all you got to do is open it in there. I opened it in there. Next day, couldn't tell. I took kitty litter and I threw it on the I cut a cut their hand and just throwed it all over the carpet. I said, that'll get it. Guess what? It didn't get it. It smelled like a drunk trying to cover up his alcohol with cologne. That's why you can smell the kitty litter and the whatever that was, uh, the kitty. And I, I, I tell you something, buddy. It was horrible. It was awful. And uh, I put... Uh, I put baking soda. I took a bag of baking soda, slung it all over there, and uh, you know what? It just got worse. And they, they, Chris told me, she said, oh, you're going to have to get rid of that carpet. You're just going to have to get rid of it. And you know what? I tried everything in the world to fix that, and it would not get that out. Finally, I was over there one day, and I said, all right, let's get it. Me and him ripped it out of that, out of that off them strips and drug it out in the backyard. And, brother, I poured some kerosene on it and set it on fire and burned it up. And it don't stink no more. I burned it, brother. I'm telling you, sometimes that's the only way you can, and the only way you're ever going to get all the old sin and curse out of this old world is burn it up, buddy. Burn it up. Uh, you want to know what God thinks about global warming? He's going to burn the whole stinking thing up one of these days. I'm talking about Los Angeles, New York City, Charlotte, Columbia. Uh, everybody's in South America, uh, Egypt, Japan, China, Russia, Europe. Europe, everywhere you can think of, Mongolia, I mean Chicago, every single building will melt. The heavens are going to be on fire. It's going to burn, brother. It's going to burn. That's why you shouldn't put all your hopes down here in this world. It's all going to burn up one day. This is a temporary place 
we stay while we look for a new heaven and a new earth. That's what's going to happen when the world's on fire. You say, well, Brother Danny, what do you think about climate change? It's going to change. Then after this, it'll be perfect. What do you think about global warming? It's a hoax now to knock our businesses out of business. What if it is getting warmer? It's always done that from creation. You say, no, they prove. No, God said in the Bible there'd always be spring, summer, harvest, and winter. There are a few variations, a few colder. It gets cold a few years, warm a few years. There's snow coming. There's record lows coming. That's just a trick to get our businesses out of it. When the, the EPA wants to shut down our environment. Listen, if the United States did everything right and never started a car, it wouldn't change the world's environment. We're only a little bitty spot on this planet, 6% of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, God will someday burn it all up. I was thinking about what's going to happen when God burns the world up. Where's all that water going to be? He'll either evaporate it, or it'll be the same place it was in, in the Old Testament when they poured that water around there and Elijah called down fire from heaven. Flames licked it up, man. Dried it up just like that. God won't have no trouble getting rid of the oceans. God won't have no trouble at all. It'll burn. It'll burn. One day it's going to burn. I'll say three things and I'm done. There's your introduction. Number one, when the world's on fire, it's too late to plan. It's too late to plan. Republicans have a plan. The Democrats have a plan. The U.N. has a plan. People are planning weddings, planning sports events, planning trips, planning vacation. But when the world's on fire, it's too late to make any plans. Too late to plan to be a soul winner. It's too late to plan to be a witness for God. Well, preacher, when I get this straightened out, I'm going to, I'm going to get started to church. I'm going to start. I'm going to get saved. Too late to plan then. When the world's on fire, it's too late to plan then. People plan to build houses. Too late then. People plan to have sporting events. No, too late then. I mean, no renegotiating. They won't be no, all right, let's try this again. There won't be no peace summits. There'll be no new world order talks. There'll be no treaty sign. There'll be no EPA, thank God. There'll be no United Nations. It's all gone. The governments of this world have failed, and the Lord one day will say, that's enough. It's too late to plan. Number two, it's too late to play. Too late to play. If you're bound and determined to party and live it up and get drunk and get high and live it up and, and fornicate and wicked, live in wickedness, you better enjoy it while you can, buddy. Because when the world's on fire, it's too late to play. Disney World's gone. Chinatown's gone. Sweden's gone. Syria's gone. A Schaffenberg gone. Germany gone. Russia gone. Listen, I know this in my... You say, well, I've never heard a message on... That shows how out of touch. We're living in this weird time when people think church is this cool place and you put big old props up and the preaching ain't much but you got a rock and roll group up here and all the soccer moms come and bring their kids cause the cool kids sing it in and you'll never hear a sermon about God burning the world up. But listen, you better listen while you can cause you won't hear this everywhere. Number three, I'm done. I said when the world's on fire it's too late to plan. When the world's on fire, it's too late to play. When the world's on fire, it's too late to pray, thirdly. You say, he wouldn't do it. I just don't believe God would do that. He did it to Sodom and Gomorrah. He did it. He's already did it. He burned it to the ground. There's ashes over there now and clumps. You can look it up. He said, it, there's, there's, I've seen them on videos. There's clumps of what they call brimstone, little pieces of it that big, all in the ground over there where Sodom and Gomorrah was right now. That's a testimony that God burned Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground. And if 
you sit here for one moment and think God's going to turn His head and wink at San Francisco and Charlotte and New York City and Morganton and any of you think God's just going to say, ah, well, it's no big deal. You've got another thing coming. He's holy God. He's God. He's God. He still hates sin as much as He did. And as a matter of fact, the Lord said, He'd be easier on them than he would on us. Sodom had no Bible. Sodom had no preachers. Sodom had no missionaries. Sodom didn't have the book they can hold in their hand. He said if God let this generation go, he'd have, Sodom and Gomorrah would have to be apologized to. I'm telling you people, I don't know who we think we are, but somehow or another we got this thing in our good old God is going to let it go. I'm telling you what good old God is. He's having mercy right now. That verse said, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But brother, when he lets go, you better not be in the way. You ride by the church like it ain't even there. Sit at home, watch a football game. Sit at come to the house of God. Yes, you. Yes, people that hear me on the internet. Yes, people that hear me on. Never open His Word. Don't even try to live right. Live in open sin. What are you going to do when the world's on fire? You say, Well, I just go to church whenever I take a notion. Well, I'm telling you what, it'll be too late to pray then. I heard about this guy who was a young lawyer. And uh, he was out one day. This guy was fishing. and He was fishing. The guy fell in the river. And the guy started screaming, Help me! Somebody help me! And the lawyer went over there and pulled him out and saved him. God, he said, Man, I thank you. What's your name? Told him, told him. And he hugged his neck. Man, you saved my life. He saved my life. You saved my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm going to tell you something, brother. It wasn't long after that. So that lawyer went on and got his education and became a judge. One day they had court, and they piled that same fella in that was in trouble for breaking the law. And when he walked in the courtroom that day, they said, All rise, the honorable so-and-so, so-and-so, and the door opened, and that guy, that judge, walked in like this. You know how they come in there like this, sit down behind that desk, and that guy said, Oh, boy, I heard my buddy. He said, Man, he's the one that saved me out there at the river that day. Man, I'm whoo, I'm off the hook. He likes me. Everything. They heard the case that day. Heard this side. Heard that side. Slammed that gavel down. Bam! Ten years in prison. And the guy come up and said, "Wait a minute, don't you remember me?" He said, "I remember you." He said, "But you got you helped me when I was out there in the river drowning." He looked at him and said, "Wait a minute, buddy. Out there on the river that day, I was your savior. Today, I'm your judge." Today, he's your Savior, y'all. He'll help you this morning. He helped me the morning that I got saved. He saved me. And on that day, he'll be your judge. He'll be your judge. See, I'm in. I'm in. You say, how do you know, preacher? Matthew 8 and verse 36 said, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Nothing. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody come to the Father but by me. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are we saved through faith. I'm glad I won't taste of the wrath of God. Titus 3 and verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. Hallelujah. Colossians 1 and verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 1 Timothy 1, 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's me and you. Amen. Romans 5.1 Therefore now being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12 I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That's where I'm going to be when the world's on fire. I'll be, oh, hide me, oh, blessed rock of ages. I'll be hid in him. Read you the words of this whole song. They used to sing this song years ago. You don't hear it much anymore. People laugh and make fun of it. This song just lives. But it's called The Great Judgment Morning. 
And it says this. They used to sing this in churches. You don't hear it much. I dreamed that the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed the nations were gathered to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel which stood on the land and sea and swore with his hand raised to heaven that time no longer would be. Some of these old songs, they weren't exactly doctrinally right, but man, they had a message in them. The rich man was there, but his money had melted and vanished away. A pauper, he stood in the judgment. His debts were too heavy to pay. The great man was there, but his greatness, when death came, was left far behind. That's Jay-Z, Beyonce, movie stars, athletes, politician. His greatness was left far behind. The angel that opened the records, not a trace of his greatness could find. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but the prayer was too late. The widow was there with the orphans. God heard and remembered her cry. No sorrow in heaven forever. God wiped all the tears from her eyes. The gambler was there and the drunkard. The man that sold him the drink. With the people who gave him the license. To hell together they did sink. And oh, what a weeping and wailing. As the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountain. They prayed, but the prayer was too late. The moral man came to the judgment, but his self-righteous rags would not do. The men had crucified Jesus. They passed off as moral men too. The soul that had put off salvation, not tonight, I'll get saved by and by. No time now to think of religion, but at last they found time to die. And oh, what a weeping and wailing. As the lost were told of their fate, they cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. Are you ready today? What will you do when the world's on fire? Let's stand by our heads in prayer. Every head bowed. Every eye's closed. No one's talking. No one's moving. God's speaking to your hearts right now. If you're here this